Hi, I'm Dr. John Newfeld. Welcome. You're uh, watching Back to the Bible Canada. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, I've been talking about the Beatitudes, and uh, I want to talk about two Beatitudes that are a bit surprising. But before I get into that, I want to address one of the obstacles, or at least a perceived obstacle, that a great many people think the Christian faith faces. And the obstacle is our fascination with sin, and consequently, as we keep on talking about sin, you know, people feel badly about themselves. I remember uh, some time ago I had a, you know, a very interesting conversation with, uh, with a woman who is a psychiatrist, and she said to me, I think the idea, and first of all, she asked me whether or not I felt I was a sinner, and I said, yes, I did. And she said, well, I think that that the idea that you think you're sinful will probably give you a low self-esteem, but also she said that the whole concept of human rights arises as individuals finally get beyond this concept of sinfulness, she said. People have to think they're worth it rather than to think they're unworthy before they can get to the place where they can you know, demand their own rights. I demand my rights because I'm worth it. At least that's what she said. And I responded because it was a great conversation. And I said to her, look, I do know that I am a sinner. And what knowing I am a sinner does for me is it strips me of all pride. In fact, I said the whole problem with narcissism is this fascination with self is because we've jettisoned the idea of sinfulness. And when it comes to human rights, I said, you know, justice only works when I think that other individuals deserve justice as much as I do, and my understanding of my sinfulness puts me in a place where I stop elevating myself above others, and I start to concern myself with the welfare of others, and that gives right a rise to the idea of, of justice and a number of other things. Well, that just started the conversation. It went on from there, and I enjoyed it, and I hope that I gave her something to actually think about. Well, why am I mentioning this? I mention this because uh, we started a series on the Sermon on the Mount, especially on the Beatitudes, and it begins with this idea that everyone who is in the kingdom starts with a presumption that I am spiritually bankrupt before God, and that realization of my spiritual bankruptcy opens a door to mercy and uh, so forth. And then the second thing that Jesus said is, you know, blessed are those who mourn. That is, we have this deep sense of weeping over our own sinfulness. Well, that's the last two Beatitudes that we looked at, or the first two in the Sermon on the Mount. And today I want to look at the next two, and I begin with the third, which Jesus says, Matthew 5, verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. What's, what's fascinating about that statement is that in the ancient Greek world, which would have read those words, um, the ancient Greek world thought that meekness was not a virtue at all. Uh, the Greeks thought that meek was negative. You know, it's basically, it's a way of becoming a doormat. A meek person, they thought, doesn't stand up for himself or herself. And, um, and they only consider their own weakness and not their own strength. I mean, I almost hear uh, my psychiatrist friend whispering in my ear, told you so. But Jesus said, blessed are the meek. Now, if being meek simply means being a doormat, well, then in that sense, Jesus himself was not meek. I mean, you might remember Jesus and his and his conflict that he had with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You brood of vipers, he says. He's not speaking to someone else about them. He, he confronts them directly. You brood of vipers, you whitewashed tomb. I mean, on the outside, you guys look fine, but on the inside, you're filled with dead men's bones. And so he rebukes them utterly, and, uh, and so he takes them on. So if meekness is being a doormat, Jesus doesn't look like that. In fact, all you have to do is imagine him walking into the temple on that day when the, you know, the money changers and, the, and, and all the different merchants are in the temple and he, and he kicks over their table and roars, you've made my house into a, into a den of thieves. It's, it was intended to be a place of worship for all the nations, and this is what you've done to it. And he's not going to take it anymore. So if you think that meekness means that everyone can run over you, I mean, just get a, a picture of the real Jesus, and you're going to find out 
He wasn't like that. So, I, so what does meekness actually mean? And so I'm going to say that meekness has nothing to do with being apathetic or lazy or content to sit back while others you know, have their way uh, in this world. Meekness is something else. And when I say things like that, you know, I, I, I wonder whether or not you think I'm performing a clever trick here. I'm changing the meaning of the word meek to make it mean something else. Um, you know, and that reminds me, it was a number of years ago, um, I, I was in a public restroom and, <laughs> or a washroom, and, 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 I, and I remember looking and there was, somebody had scribbled some graffiti on the wall and it said, we meek will inherit the earth. And then in brackets underneath, it said, if that's all right with the rest of you guys. So, you know, the idea behind it, it's preposterous to think that the meek would inherit the earth because being meek, they would say, is that all right with you guys? And the rest of them would say, no, it's not. And therefore the meek will never inherit the earth. I mean, being meek, at least by the definition that we conceive of in our own mind, means you're getting nowhere in life. So we have to ask ourselves again, what did Jesus mean when he said, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. They're going to win in the end, and the earth is going to be theirs and not others. So what does he mean when he says that? Well, first of all, I'll take you back to the Old Testament. And uh, remember that uh, Jesus, when he said, blessed are the meek, he's actually quoting from Psalm 37. So uh, let me read to you a portion of that, verses 7 to 11. So Listen in. This is a Psalm of David, and here's what David says. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It only tends to evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Now, consider how David describes the meek. They're not to fret themselves when, you know, or rage when evil men seem to have their way. That is, they don't get themselves so worked up that they're red-faced and they're ready, you know, to have a heart attack. Um, they don't shout obscenities. They don't get so worked up that that's all they ever think about. Rather, the meek, according to David here, they have this settled awareness that God is going to act and that they're on the winning side. So according to this psalm, the defining thing that marks the meek is that they patiently wait for the Lord to act. Now, so, you know, some people have given a synonym for the term meek, which is the idea of gentleness, and yes, that's a part of it, but it's not all of it. So I want to take a little more time with this idea of being meek. So in order to understand meekness, don't think of Jesus saying as blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. I mean, please don't think of that as a saying that is meant to be considered in and of its own. The Beatitudes are not seven separate statements. They are rather all a part of one. So if Jesus has already said, blessed are the spiritually impoverished and blessed are those who mourn over their spiritual impoverishment, then we must mean that meekness rises out of a recognition of my sinful condition before God and a sense of weeping over it. Meekness must have something to do with my response over what I find within myself. So having said that, what does it mean to be meek? And I'm going to say uh, the answer is the meek person is the individual who has a sense of his or her unworthiness before God and therefore because of that doesn't act with arrogance towards others. In other words, they're transformed in the way in which they treat others. So, you know, a number of Bible teachers have put words together like gentleness and humility and not given to hypersensitivity when others insult us. Indeed, an individual who who doesn't put himself or herself at the center of everything. I mean, we all know of individuals who do that, and maybe you're one of those. Uh, You know, you, you can't be satisfied until you're the center of the conversation. The meek person doesn't think in that fashion. And in fact, the meek person isn't a doormat at all. 
The meek person, according to Psalm 37, is not a person who's at peace when wicked people continue to prosper, but the meek person has substituted himself or herself at the center of things and rather has put God at the center of all things. That's what meekness actually is. Meek individuals hope in God, wait for him to act, and are actively involved in following God so that all action is done to put God at the center. If I would give an illustration of that, I would use Jesus as the example. You know, Philippians 2, Paul writes about the nature of Jesus, and he says, although Jesus always existed in the form of God, yet he did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped or as a treasure constantly be paraded in front of others. So you've got to imagine Jesus taking upon himself the form of a man and being found in human likeness, God becomes man, and as man, Jesus doesn't use his authority as God to his own advantage, but makes himself nothing for the sake of his mission that the Father entrusted to him. So that's the meekness of Jesus. He puts God the Father at the center, And then he puts himself in obedience to God the Father and is willing to take a humble place so that the Father is exalted. So that's what Jesus is getting at. And his followers, the citizens of his kingdom, are individuals who are content when all glory goes to Christ. And they look to Jesus to put him at the center and are not that concerned with how they will look to others. See, that's the idea behind it. So I'm looking for an illustration for that. And I, as I looked around, I, I could think of no better than the illustration of William Carey. Now, if you don't know who William Carey was, he uh, organized what was called a London Missionary Society in 1795. And William Carey is often thought of as the, the father of Protestant missions. Uh, William Carey was a remarkable man. He traveled to India, a land with over a thousand languages, and he was determined to translate the Bible into some of the Indian languages. And uh, I know that uh, there were seven or eight languages that he himself translated. His capacity to learn languages was amazing. His capacity then to plant churches, to preach the gospel, and to build viable congregations that had the Bible in their own language. I mean, it's breathtaking what he was able to accomplish. Uh, Beyond that, uh, Carey also worked on a political scene. Uh, He brought an end to the Indian practice of seti. If you don't know what seti was, seti meant that when a man died, you would burn that you know, man's body, but then you'd also burn his living widow along with him. And Kerry lobbied the British overlords to bring that practice to an end. He was a man of remarkable achievements, and his remarkable achievements lit a fire in the Protestant community and led the way to the evangelical mission to reach the world for Christ. William Carey is considered the father of that. He's a remarkable man with remarkable achievement, a man whose energy level was, you know, over over the roof, as they say, and beyond. Well, I'd like to tell a little story that once happened to William Carey. On one occasion, he was sitting at a table at a banquet in which there was a, a British general And the British general made a comment which he thought was out of the hearing of William Carey. William Carey is sitting there, and the British general is making a comment to a man by the name of Lord Hastings. And the British general is saying to Lord Hastings that all William Carey really was, he's an overrated man, he said. He was just a shoemaker. That's all he is, and we're making far too much of him. Now, Carey heard that. And instead of saying, hey, just a minute, let me ask you what you've accomplished. Let me give you a list of my accomplishments. And you want to come back on that? And you see, it's not what Kerry said at all. In fact, Kerry overheard the comment and he said to the general, I, no, sir, you're absolutely incorrect. I am not only a shoemaker. I am only a cobbler. In other words, I didn't make the shoes. I only fixed them. I'm much lower than you actually think I am. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's an amazing comeback. You know, he says, you ain't nothing. And Carrie says, oh, I'm less than you actually think I am. And that tells you 
actually how great Jesus is that he would use someone of as little attributes as I have to accomplish these things. It must be Christ that's the explanation of everything that I've done and not me. See, that, that's what meekness is all about. Kerry never backed off. Kerry never stopped in his labors to bring Christ to India. Kerry's list of accomplishments are monumental. I mean, it's almost superhuman. You wouldn't think a man would be able to accomplish that. And in the end of the day, he simply said, hey, you know, I'm actually less than a shoemaker. I'm only a cobbler. Meekness continues to strive for the glory of Christ without consideration of self. Jesus said, blessed are the meek. People who act like that, they're going to inherit the earth. That is, when everything else is said and done, when all of the proud men and women of this world who have cared for nothing but their own reputation, when they've all passed away and this present age has come to an end, it's the meek that will inherit the earth. It's quite a statement. Now I'm going to go to the next statement that Jesus makes, and that's in Matthew 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. So there's something very significant here. Now notice what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say, blessed are the righteous. (laughs) That's not blessed are the righteous. I mean, every one of us who are in the kingdom of heaven start with this an awareness of our own spiritual poverty. We're not going to say we're righteous. We're going to say only God is righteous. Meekness in the end would never draw attention to our own righteousness, but rather draw attention to our own spiritual poverty. See, that's the reality, but that's where something has to happen here. Blessed are the righteous, uh, not the righteous, but blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now, you, you might say, in a sense, everyone hungers and thirsts after righteousness. Uh, and here's why. And I've often said that part of being made in the image of God, what it means to be human, is to have a sense of oughtness. And when I say a sense of oughtness is that every human being has a sense that some things ought not to be, and some things ought to be. And that's why when we get together with others in a coffee shop or somewhere else and we begin to, you know, fix the whole world and we talk about everything from, you know, politics to, um, you know, to what's happening in medicine and, and uh, the rising debt problem and, you know, and how the police should be doing a better job at what they're doing and you know, everything else that we talk about. So by the time we've complained about everything, we've fixed the world. So you might say, now isn't that hungering and thirsting after righteousness? And don't we all do it? We all want a better world than we presently have. And we all want that because everyone universally complains. But notice Jesus didn't say, blessed are the complainers. (laughs) Because complaining, I mean, it just comes naturally to all of us. Rather, he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. So I'm going to try to explain that. And I'm going to say that there is a progression of thought here. And I've got to assume that Jesus intended at least four things when he said that. Number one, the hunger, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness are first those who hunger and thirst after righteousness in themselves. See, long before you're about to fix the world, you become, you come to the conclusion that (laughs) I'm not fixed. I long for the day when the spiritual poverty that I see in myself will ultimately be healed. See, that's the beginning of hungering and thirsting after righteousness. The person who hungers and thirsts after righteousness in themselves is the person who recognizes when they see lust that should not be there, when there's anger, when there's feelings of revenge, when there's greed within themselves, not first pointing at the greed in others, but seeing it in themselves, when they see selfishness, idolatry, deception, jealousy, and they cry out to God and say, I hunger and thirst for the day when this, this flesh of mine, this, this, this lower desire that I have that seeks after things that are unworthy, I long for the day, O oh God, when you slay it and put it to rest so that I will never struggle with these feelings again. See, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness in themselves. It's the place to start. 
And I'm, I say this again because so many of us ignore ourselves when we're ready to fix others. I mean, Jesus says how easy it was to try to pick out the speck in someone else's eye when there's a log that we don't see in our own eyes. See, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness in themselves. That's the first point. Uh, here's the second one. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness that leads them to the cross, to the gospel. See, Romans 1 verse 17 says that uh, in the cross, a righteousness of God is revealed. See, this is, this is this wonderful fascination with what Jesus accomplished on the cross. You know, many of us only see the mercy of God on the cross, and please don't misunderstand me. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to see God's mercy on full display in the sufferings of Jesus as he hangs on the cross. That's a wonderful thing. But when you read Romans chapter 3, you find out that the cross is a demonstration of God's righteousness first of all. God states that he would not leave sin unpunished. When Jesus suffers so horribly on the cross, the Father is saying, this is what sin actually deserves. This is what righteousness actually looks like. See, long before we say, I'd like to fix this in the world, and that doesn't suit me very well, and boy, if only those politicians would come in line. Long before we see that, we look at the cross of Jesus and we see, there, there, that's what righteousness looks like. This is what it takes to end sin in the life, it, it, in, in the world. It takes the death death of Jesus Christ on the cross. See, that's blessed are those who long to see the righteousness of God revealed in the sufferings of Jesus and thereby see the fully righteous Father. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after a vision that looks like that. Mm -hmm. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst of righteousness in themselves and who hunger and thirst to see more deeply the righteousness of the cross of Jesus. Thirdly, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, and that does mean that they care about righteousness in the world. See, we're not, as believers, blind to the deep injustices that are done in this world. We recognize that it must be solved, and so Christians are, in one sense, activists to be sure. It means that we care about the poor. And by the way, everywhere the Christian gospel has gone, alongside of the gospel has gone two things. One is hospitals and the others are schools. We care about literacy and we care also about the care of the sick and the care of the impoverished. See, Christian missions never is simply a declaration, you know, you need to get right with God. Christian missions is that, of course, and it can never be anything short of that. But Christian missions also cares about the physical well-being of those who are oppressed, those who are needy, and those who need to be lifted. There is something about hungering and thirsting after things like um, health care. Uh, but also, we hunger and thirst so that this carnage in our day, and I say it's a carnage, that is the destruction of the unborn would eventually be put to an end. See, it's a horrible thing that we see happening in our land. I mean, we see uh, children being seen or unborn children being seen as an inconvenience rather than a gift of God. While on the one hand, there are individuals waiting to adopt unwanted children, so many mothers and fathers are being told that if you have an unwanted child, just simply kill that unwanted child rather than to give that unwanted child the gift of life. You see, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after all the injustices that are being done and who say, I long to be a part of the solution. I who recognize my own spiritual poverty. I'm not going out there pointing fingers, but I'm looking to be a part of the solution to that. So I've talked about, you know, a recognition of spiritual poverty in myself. I've talked about a recognition of the righteousness of God on the cross, and then also a recognition that righteousness need to be attained in our culture. And then also, fourthly, I want to say that if we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we're hungering and thirsting after the second coming of Jesus. Because there will come a time when the king enters into the world, and the Bible says he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. That is to say, 
perfect righteousness will come into place. Evil will ultimately be stopped. There is this hunger in every single believer for the day when Christ actually comes and sets up his kingdom and evil will be no more. So when we say blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, we're saying a mouthful, aren't we? We're saying a great deal. And I'm quite sure that those four things are intended. Now, I want to get back to this idea of hungering and thirsting for it, because there's a difference between hungry, hungering and thirsting and something simply being a hobby. You know, I use the illustration of people getting together in a coffee shop and complaining about everything that's wrong in the world. But then they go on to do other things. You know, they maybe have a round of golf they want to play, or you know, maybe they get back to something else, maybe their work or something that needs to be done at home, and then life goes back to normal. In other words, it's not the dominating feature of their lives, it's just what they complain about on the odd occasion. Hungering and thirsting after righteousness looks different. And in the Western world, we tend not to understand what hungering and thirsting actually feels like. I grew up um, a child of parents who were refugees. Uh, My father's brother died of malnutrition in the former Soviet Union. My father and my mother grew up in the Ukraine. And uh, in the Ukraine, if you don't know it, the, uh, the topsoil uh, of this rich farmland that is there some will, will often be over a, fi- a foot thick. It's, it's deep and it's rich and it should produce the most bounteous harvest on earth. But when communist, communism came into power, uh, everything changed and the farmers that were living on the land were refused access to their own produce. And so many of them living on this rich farmland actually starved to death in a land of plenty. It's just one of the horrific stories. And my parents would often tell us what it felt like uh, when they felt hunger. Hunger meant that you would not only go to bed on an empty stomach, but you dreamt about eating and it dominated your thoughts all the day long. There was hardly a thought that you would think that was not also consumed with this whole idea of food and the longing for sustenance. To hunger in that sense, to thirst in that sense, means that righteousness and the kingdom of God is not a hobby that we happen to have. It becomes the all-consuming passion of our lives. We're not content until Christ physically returns and that the glory of God fills the earth as the waters cover the sea. We recognize that things are not that way now, and it feels to us as if, as it feels like hunger. It's what dominates our thinking. And Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, and then he makes a promise, they shall be satisfied. You know, as I thought about all that, I put a couple of lines together, and I kind of like to end with those lines, and I want you to listen to these. I said, but for those who are aware of their spiritual poverty, they are aware also that they are weeping over it and that it has made them meek. One day they know that the situation will be reversed. The kingdoms of this earth are destined to collapse and the kingdom of heaven will be established forever and ever. Those who are rich in this earth will mourn and weep in those days. And those who today mourn and weep because they so long for righteousness will find a time when that mourning will come to an end. The night will end, the day will dawn, and they will clap their hands with great joy. How blessed they are, said Jesus, spiritual poverty and bankruptcy is the pathway to true riches, and there's the invitation. Wouldn't you want that? Wouldn't you like to be a part of the people group who have such a longing, and the only hope for that longing is that God would be true to his promises and fulfill them in the final day? In the end, when the kingdom of heaven finally is fully inaugurated on this earth, those who have spent a lifetime passionately hungering for it, will clap their hands with great joy for all that they had hoped for will finally come to fruition. Tell me this, who else in this life hopes for something intensely and sees it come to fruition? 
So many people have hoped for something that ends up being a great disappointment. And Jesus has said, this thing that my people hope for will never be a disappointment. I stake my reputation on it. Hey, thanks for watching Back to the Bible Canada today. We, I wish you God's blessing on this day as you consider the words of Jesus and apply them to your life. May the Lord be with you. Thank you for watching today, and I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.